A tecnologia e a inovação são as forças que nos movimentam. Essa energia leva a conexão de qualidade com preços acessíveis aos locais mais distantes do país, promove a inclusão digital e acelera o desenvolvimento econômico-social dos brasileiros. Muito além da nossa rede de fibra ótica, reforçada pelo satélite geoestacionário e pelo cabo submarino Brasil-Europa, a rede que mais nos motiva é a de pessoas unidas e felizes. Telebras. Tecnologia que une pessoas. E aí, galerinha, beleza? Vocês sabem que agora é a hora que eu tenho que gritar, né? Então, bem aqui eu vou falar alto, tá certo? Né? Os caras aqui da frente, principalmente, tá certo? A galera aí no canto, beleza? Posso falar alto ou não? Ok? O pessoal do som tá beleza aí, não? Boa noite, Campos Party! Ô! Oh! 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 Galera, essa é a palestra que a gente estava esperando, é ou não é? Não precisa nem dizer, né? Tá todo mundo aqui. Eu só não sei o que, que a outra galera que não está aqui está fazendo. Tá certo? Acho que os caras não fazem ideia de quem vem aqui, não é isso? Não? Você sabe, você sabe quem vem aqui? Então... Ele já tá aqui, ó, tá aqui no cantinho. Deixa eu só falar uma coisa. A palestra agora vai ser em inglês. Eu já passei ali, ainda tem bastante radinho. Quem precisar de tradução, passa ali, pega a tradução, tá? Ó, já tem uma pessoa que já tinha esquecido aqui. Tá certo? Né? Corre lá pra você não perder. Viu? Ainda tem bastante radinho de tradução ali que a galera avisou. Né? Passa lá pra pegar. Lembrando de não esquecer de devolver no final, tá? Todo ano tem um carinha que fica sem RG, tem um carinha que não pode dirigir por duas semanas até a gente conseguir achar o cara e entregar a carteira dele, né? Sempre lembrando de devolver é, o radinho, tá certo? E aí, eu quero saber o seguinte, quem aqui curtiu Matrix? <risos> tá certo, por isso tá todo mundo aqui. Deixa eu ver o que mais. Quem aqui adora... O R2 D2. Né? Quem não sabe quem é o R2 D2? Tá bom, o R2 D2. Ah, agora você sabe quem é, né? Ah, beleza, ok. Então tá bom. Então, meu, não ia ser muito massa você ter um R2 D2 pra brincar? Mas não um qualquer, o de verdade. Assim para brincar em casa, né? Oi? Qualquer um seria da hora, imagina de verdade, né? Oi? Ainda mais funcionar, né? Agora, mais legal do que você ter um R2-D2 que funciona em casa é você ser o cara por trás do R2-D2. Né? <risos> tá certo, aí a coisa fica bacana, né? Então... O carinha que vai falar com a gente aqui agora foi o carinha por trás do R2-D2, é certo? Participou de vários filmes massa, como Matrix, né? É... Jurassic Park, tá certo? Foi o cara que ajudou aí nos efeitos especiais de filmes que a gente adora, que a gente curte. É isso aí, galera! Vai começar aqui na Campus Party o magistral da noite. Ó, oh, você que tá aí de bobeira, não sabe o que você tá perdendo... Vou falar uma coisa para vocês, um segredo, hein? É o melhor magistral da Campos! É, o... é isso aí, tá certo? Olha o senhor Francesco ali, presidente do Instituto Campos Party. Salva de palmas para o Instituto Campos Party. É isso aí, galera. O Instituto Campos Party é o responsável... É, a, é a, a organização sem, sem fins lucrativos que é responsável pelo conteúdo da Campus. Eu fui presidente durante bastante tempo, não sou mais, acabou meu mandato, mas continuo me, me deixando subir no palco aqui, né? Os caras não têm noção, né? <risos> tá certo? É isso aí. Todo mundo já tá com o radinho? Acabou o radinho lá atrás? Não tem fila? Ainda tem fila lá atrás? Então, beleza, já vamos começar aqui. Galera, daqui a pouco, deixa eu ver que filme mais esse cara fez. Não dá para lembrar de todos, né? Olha só... O cara fez Jurassic Park, O Exterminador do Futuro 3. Caracoles, hein? 
porra. A gente, a gente paga só para estar tá é, no parque de diversões, né? Do filme que o cara fez, né? Tá certo? É, inteligência artificial. Matrix, Matrix Reloaded, Matrix Revolution. Tá certo? Esse cara é o cara, meu. Além de tudo isso, muita gente conhece ele, porque ele participa de um programa muito bacana. Você sabe qual é o programa ou não? Qual que é? é? Everyone knows you're here, man. I have nothing to say. Right? But are you going to talk about R2D2 here? Yes. Did you bring him with you? Oh, come on. We're all waiting for him, not for you. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Is it time already? Tá no horário não? We still have two minutes. We got to start on time here. Yes? All right. Okay. É isso aí, galera. Daqui a, um, daqui a dois minutos, no palco principal da Campus Party, um minuto. Tá certo? O cara que fez os filmes mais massa do planeta, certo? E aí? Daqui a pouquinho, Grant Imahara, aqui no palco da Campus. Não, wait. I'm not, I didn't call you yet. Oi? Tava faltando eu? Tava nada, tava faltando vocês, né? Tá certo? Galera, a Campus Party, a gente faz a Campus Party pra vocês. Tá certo? E é, eu queria aproveitar o seguinte, vocês estão aqui, vários dias de evento, 24 horas, tá certo? E a gente vê muitas vezes uma galera que está só com os amigos do lado. Né? Fazendo as perguntas assim, você conhece o cara que está do seu lado? Conhece? Você conhece o cara que está do seu lado? Oi? Não, né? Mas os dois estão juntos aqui. E você, conhece o cara que está do seu lado? Conhece, né? Olha que interessante. Tem dois caras aqui. Aí tem um, Eles estão sentados aqui, mas tem um espacinho. Aí tem dois caras coladinhos no outro aqui. Tá certo? Né? Com certeza são amigos, são amigos. Aí tem um espaço aqui, né? Você conhece o cara que tá do seu lado aqui, não? Não conhece, muito bem. Parabéns. Porque o negócio é o seguinte, galera, na Campus Party, nosso objetivo é conhecer gente nova. Tá certo? A gente fazer novas amizades. Então, claro que é legal estar com seu amigo, muito bacana. Mas o mais importante é você aproveitar o evento para conhecer gente nova. Então, dá uma olhada pro lado, vê se acha alguém que você não conhece e cumprimenta o cara do lado aí. Isso, cumprimento. Aê! Isso mesmo. Vocês também estão em pé e cumprimento o cara do lado. Tá certo? Porque olha só. Já começou, né? Olha só, somos todos nerds, galera. Tá certo? E a... sabe qual é a diferença entre o nerd introvertido e o nerd extrovertido? O nerd introvertido, ele olha para o próprio pé quando ele fala com você. O nerd extrovertido, ele olha para o seu pé quando ele fala com você. Então é o seguinte, somos todos nerds. O cara está do seu lado, ele também é nerd, ele não tem coragem de falar com você. tá certo? Então aproveita e quebra o gelo para que a gente saia aqui da Campus Party, todo mundo sendo amigo, porque é o seguinte, é só com a amizade que a gente vai mudar esse país. Ok? É isso aí? Beleza. Então, sem mais delongas, eu vou chamar o cara... Tá certo? Que vai nos contar tudo aqui, né? Então, uma gigantesca salva de palmas para Grant Imahara. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Hello Campus Party Brazil. Do you want to know how much I love you? When I was first presented with the opportunity to speak here at Campus Party Brazil, I said yes, absolutely. I've done Campus Party before. I know what the deal is. I know that people camp here, but more importantly, it's about sharing ideas. It's about making campuseros interested in science and technology. This is how much I love you. I'm working on a new show. It might be news to some of you. Mythbusters is done. They're still airing the last episodes. Carrie Tori and I are working on a new show. 
They said the only way that you can do campus party is if you fly there and then you come right back. So I flew here this morning 12 hours. I'm going to be here 12 hours. Right after this, I go straight to the airport and I fly home 12 hours. That is how much I want to be here with you at Campus Party. I love the enthusiasm, the energy that I feel here at Campus Party. And everything that you're interested in is everything that I'm interested in too. So it's a great honor to be here. Okay. Enough of that, let's begin. So, this talk is about engineering and entertainment. <laughs> Two things that people think are very different, engineering and entertainment, but I think as you'll see, these are two things that work very well together. It's also about my career working with these, these two things coming together, and a little bit of advice that I have for all of you. Let's begin. Now, most of you know me from Mythbusters. You, you, are, you get Mythbusters here, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, for those people who don't know what Mythbusters is, first of all, this is our cast. This is boy, Tori, girl, Carrie, Jamie, uh, Jamie, uh, Buster, and Adam and me. Now, people ask me, how did Mythbusters start? Was it Adam and Jamie's idea? Actually, there was a producer in Australia that had the idea for this show. But he needed somebody who could talk about the science, but also build everything in it. Set up the experiments, perform the experiments, and this required a special person. This producer had interviewed Jamie for Robot Wars. Jamie had a, a fighting robot named Blendo. At one point in Robot Wars, Jamie's robot Blendo was the most feared the most destructive, the most dangerous robot in all of robot combat. So much so that there were entire websites dedicated to beating his robot. In fact, the robot that finally beat him was built solely, not to defeat the other 26 competitors, it was built just to defeat one. By the way, his robot, just so you know, three horsepower gasoline engine with a, a metal dome as a cooking wok for making Chinese food. He flipped it upside down. <laughs> Two steel blades spinning about 300 revolutions per minute. Absolutely deadly. Any robot that it touched would explode literally, like fly into pieces. And that producer said, this, this is the man. <laughs> so he approached Jamie and said, Jamie, I got this great idea for a show. I would like you to host. And you know, if you ever said Jamie, it's like, oh, well, I, I don't talk too well on camera, but I have a friend who does, and that's Adam. Now, I used to work for Jamie at night and on weekends, helping him out with animatronics. That was my specialty. I also used to work with Adam at Industrial Light and Magic. If you've ever watched the show, you, you see how their, their two personalities are. Jamie is very methodical. Adam is not. Adam is, is like a whirlwind a tornado that, that runs through the shop, leaving a wake of, of materials behind him. He is, however, one of the fastest builders that I have ever seen.
But he's the kind of guy who, even before he was on TV, it was as if he was on TV. He would juggle and tell jokes and, and just run around the shop like a madman. And it was that perfect combination of the two that launched the show. But the thing is, Discovery wanted a new episode every week. In their ideal world, there would be a new Mythbusters on every week, every week of the year. But they couldn't keep up with that pace. And so they brought in the build team. Tori and I used to work at ILM together. Carrie was an intern at M5, Jamie's shop. And uh, I had joined the cast after Scotty left. But we all have a background in special effects. What makes us great for the show is that we solve problems. We build things very quickly. And we all have a love of science and technology. Now, some of the things, I'll just go through the things on the show fairly quickly, just so you get a feel of what we did. Drafting a big rig is when you drive very closely behind a big truck. The closer that you get, the more fuel you save. Even closer, even more fuel. Right up on the bumper, best possible situation. There's only two problems with this. Number one, it's illegal. <laughs> and number two, it's very, very dangerous. So it's not worth trying to save a little bit of money just so you can uh, do this and, and you, it's, don't do it. This is the Watcha. Now some of these myths that we did were historical ones, like this one where it would fire 400 arrows with rockets on them. <laughs> Just think about that. A, an arrow with a rocket on it. That in itself is dangerous enough. Now think about 400 of them flying through the air at you and your army. Then you start to feel what this type of weapon, it's an ancient weapon, what this type of weapon, the kind of fear that it would instill. Now, as far as a weapon goes, 400 rocket-propelled arrows, maybe you hit somebody, maybe you don't. The thing is, that's not the point. The point is that when you see 400 rocket-propelled arrows flying through the air, it makes you want to run away. And that is the power of the Huacha. Bird balance is one where, if in the movies, two guys are driving, right, there's a chase, they see, oh no, there's a cliff, and they slam on the brakes, and they stop right at the edge, right? Perfectly balanced on the edge, and then the bird comes and lands right on the hood. And then, no, 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 and then they go over. In reality, it doesn't happen like that, unfortunately. Just like in the movies, it doesn't happen exactly like that. I had to build a turkey chandelier 40 turkeys hanging from this suspended rig. And we had a limousine, a long, long vehicle. It took several hundred pounds worth of birds. I dropped them one by one, too. Just like you pull a string, turkey drops. Pull a string, another turkey drops. Several hundred pounds of turkeys later, it finally went over. So not everything you see in the movies is exactly how it is in real life. Um, if you've seen the movie Predator, in Predator, they, they cut down trees with a machine gun. and brrr. We tried that. Uh, it actually works pretty good. <laughs> You just have to have a, a really, really big machine gun. And then one of my favorites from recent times, we were trying to catch a pig, okay? Just a little pig, right? A little pig that's greased, that's really hard to, to catch them. And so part of what I did on the show was come up with these solutions, these 
ways of building things. So my idea was to make a pair of mechanical claws to catch the pig by the, by the leg. It's important to note that the claw did not close all the way. It stopped just so I could grab it around the, around the ankle. It worked great, except for the part where you have to run around and get close enough to the pig to fire the claw. As it turns out, Carrie had a pair of furry gloves that she was able to catch the pig much faster. So it, the most high-tech approach sometimes isn't the best. Now, sometimes you end up doing things like um, you're in your underwear on the show. That was one of the most important things about Mythbusters is not to take things too seriously, or rather to take the right things seriously. Designing the experiments, taking the data, analyzing the data, those are all things to take seriously. Walking around in your underwear, not so much. This is when you can, uh, if you are a superhero like Superman and you have to change in a phone booth, can you do it? It's very difficult. And of course, there are the types of myths that are super, super big, like this one. One of the biggest ones that we've done, strapping six rockets onto a Chevy Impala, building a giant ramp out in the middle of the desert, firing them all off, driving it by remote control. One of the hugest myths we've ever done. But enough of that. I'm going to go back and talk about how I got started and what influenced me, because I think that's really what's most important for you, Camposeros. Finding a mentor. When you're trying to learn something, when you're really interested in something, one of the best things that you can do is find someone who already does that. And a lot of these people are willing to help you. That is a mentor. My mentor was a guy named Tomlinson Holman. Now, you might not know his name, like Elon Musk or, or something like that, but he's a celebrity engineer. He invented the THX sound system. In fact, THX, you know, you know THX, the That's a movie sound system. He invented it. The TH is Tom Holman, and the X is Tom Holman's experiment. He was working at the cinema school, and I wanted to find a way to combine entertainment and technology. I was studying engineering. I'm an electrical engineer at USC. How I found Tom is the guide in the cinema school. I talked to that person and said, can I, can I sit in on a course? Can I? And he said, no. How about if I help? And he said, no. But he said, you should go and talk to Tom Holman. He invented THX. So he's like, his office is right downstairs. And so I went to Tom's office. And I literally stumbled in and said, Mr. Holman, did you invent THX? And he said, yes. And I said, can I be your assistant? And he said, yes. Do I have to pay you? And I said, no. And so I ended up organizing his office, which Tom at that time, and probably still, was the absent-minded professor. He had stacks and stacks and stacks of journals and books. But the great thing about Tom as a mentor is that he gave me things to read. He took me to meetings. During that time I was working for Tom, I was absorbing all that knowledge, which is exactly what a mentor is supposed to do, give you that opportunity to get the knowledge that you want. 
Be available to opportunity. Opportunity may hit you at any point. <laughs> the problem is you don't know exactly when. So you have to be as available as possible at all times. This is how I got into industrial light and magic. A friend of mine was working at ILM in the model shop. Two friends of mine, Don Bees and Nelson Hall. And they said, we're working on Men in Black and Mars Attacks and The Lost World, the sequel to Jurassic Park. And you know what? They kind of need somebody with your skills. Would you be able to come and you know, do like a week of work with us? <laughs> and I was like, I am so afraid. Because up to that point, I'd been working for Tom at THX. Stable, full-time job, full benefits. Working at the model shop? The manager of the model shop, Mark Anderson, said, don't quit your day job. And I didn't, actually. I took a two-week leave of absence to work at ILM. But before I agreed to do this, I asked my department manager, her name was Monica Dashwood, she ran THX division. I said, Monica, what should I do? I have this chance, but I am, I'm, so, I'm so afraid. And she goes, here's what I do. If I have the chance to do something cool and that chance may never come again, I do it without hesitation. It's better knowing than wondering. And I had a sleepless night, a couple sleepless nights, and finally I said, okay, I'm going to do this. But you should know that fear is going to be part of it. If you're pushing forward, a lot of times you won't know. I didn't know whether I would be successful at ILM. I just had to accept that fear and make that a part of what I was doing. As it turned out, I was okay. They did need someone with my skills. This is a robot, uh, animatronics. Combines electronics and animation, animatronics. And so basically, if it lit up or moved at ILM, I was involved. That two-week gig turned into nine years. I worked on The Lost World which is a sequel to Jurassic Park. This is, this is Jurassic Park Stadium. In here on this little track, there's a little car, a red car that, that Jeff Goldblum drives. That car is only this big. I worked on Galaxy Quest, my favorite Star Trek sequel ever. And this, in this, this is the Protector. So in Star Trek, they have the Enterprise. In Galaxy Quest, their ship is called the Protector. Now, when I speak to this crowd and say that there are two 8-bit reduced instruction set microcontrollers inside of here, you're probably going to know what I'm talking about. Most of the time, I just I say to people, I just made the lights blink. And then Star Wars came along, the prequels. This is me and Tori. So people, look how young we are. Look at that. People ask how long I've known Tori. I mean, you know, I've known uh, Adam and Jamie, oh my, like 20 years now? Is that right? Oh, that's crazy. Same thing with Tori. Oh, man. I didn't even think about that until just now. Trade Federation hangar. So these are, these are some of the projects that, that I got to work on involving the technology that I had learned in engineering school with something incredibly creative. At ILM, we were making worlds that no one had ever seen before. And a lot of times, you basically get a piece of paper and a brief description of what you're supposed to be building especially on Star Wars, we were making all these things. We didn't know exactly what they were for. 
because nobody would let us read a script. It was that secret. If you wanted to read the script of Star Wars Episode One, you had to first you had to be a supervisor or higher, and then you had to go to a special room where you could check out the script, and it would not leave that room. And then when you were done, you had to to say, "Okay, thank you very much. Sign it out and." And leave it there. That's how secret it was. And then Star Wars Episode Three. So this is uh, what I worked on over the years, about nine years worth. You can see the last one there is Triple X Two, State of the Union. That was at about the point where computer graphics started taking over, and the practical. Effects, which is where I worked, those jobs started to become fewer and fewer, and so I knew that there was, it was time to make a change. It was time to go to, uh, and that it was right around then that the opportunity came up to join the guys on MythBusters. Now I'm going to talk about a few of the projects that I worked on. Um, you, I assume you guys know what the Energizer Bunny is. He beats a drum. He sells batteries. When I ask most people how big they think the Energizer Bunny is, it, I think he's about this big. He's actually this big. He's really huge. But that's because he's packed with technology. There are upwards of 18 servos inside of him, small motors to control the various things. These are his ears. This is his head. His arm. My contribution to this project was electronics. I programmed the beat for the Energizer Bunny. Now, a lot of people say, "Well, wait a minute. The Energizer Bunny's been around for decades, for a long, long time." It's true. Due to a change with the guy who actually created the first generation. They didn't want to work with him anymore, and so he said, "Fine, I will take my Energizer bunnies and go." And so this company, the EverReady Battery Company, as they were called in those days, suddenly had there was no bunny, there was no bunny, and so they came to us and said, "Can you create a new generation?" There's two things. As we were like, "Okay, great, we can we can do that." There's two things the bunny has to do. Okay, what's number one? Number one, the bunny has to beat consistently. I said, "Well, how was the bunny beating before?" And they go, "There's a guy. Has two joysticks and a metronome, and he listens to the metronome, and then he moves the joysticks to beat. And they're having problems when they go to lay in the beating sound." In post-production, with making the commercials, that it doesn't match up, and so I said, "Okay, no problem. I can program a microcontroller that beat will be precise within、uh, a microsecond or so every time." They're like, "Okay, great. What's what's the second thing? Second thing is the Energizer Bunny has to run on Energizer batteries." Up to that point, the bunnies didn't use Energizer batteries. Up to that point, every puppet that we made in those days used sealed lead acid batteries. Here's why: consumer grade batteries suck. They're horrible. From the perspective of an engineer, I will qualify that. They are horrible because they can't put out a huge amount of current. Current is what you need to drive the motors. There's a very good reason why they don't, because you don't want a battery sitting in your pocket to burst into flames. So, but I said, okay, I will make it run on Energizer batteries. I will solve that problem. And so, what I did was create a battery pack. That held 44 AA batteries. They didn't say how many. 
that battery pack, it was like an AK-47 clip. It was like a, a big banana shape, a big black banana shaped plastic pack. And it slipped right into uh, where all the electronics were. The Energizer Bunny for I'll, I'll give you some quick facts. You see the name Garth right here? So the second generation of, first generation of bunnies had names. A, B, C, D. Al, Bert, like Chuck, and Dave. Second generation, E, F, and G, were called Earl, Floyd, and Garth. And Garth is named after Garth Brooks. Bunny wears size five women's flip-flops. Imitation Wayfarer sunglasses. The bunny fur is synthetic. And it's so special that there was only, when we made the bunnies, there was only one bolt of fur left in the world. It was that custom consistency and color. And so we had to use, we had to, to be really, really careful when we were cutting the fur. I started out as the arms guy. It takes three people to run an Energizer bunny, the arms guy. Arms guy flips, I, 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 get, I got the easiest job by far. Arms guy flips a switch, right? Bunny starts beating. Flip another switch, bunny stops beating, spins, twirls the sticks. Head guy, head guy moves the head and does, I'll give you here. Okay, typical Energizer Bunny commercial, right? Somebody's doing something and then the bunny comes and interrupts them, right? As he walks through frame, he's beating, bobbing his head, and then he goes like this, puts his head back, spins the sticks, spins in place, and then drops the sticks and continues beating and then he goes, hey, what's up? So the arms guy, the head guy, and the driver. Driver's the hardest job by far. I started out as arms guy, moved my way up, and became the head of that crew and the driver. Why is it so important to have a good driver? Each bunny, I can't tell you how much they cost. Each bunny. Do you know what a Ferrari Testarossa is? That's about the range of what a bunny costs. And so you don't want to drive the bunny off the edge of a stage or into a ditch or in any way damage the bunny or his fur. Oh wait, the bunny also comes with a mechanic and a fluffer. And the fluffer fluffs the tail and polishes the glasses and makes sure his little bunny suit's all good. Okay, Star Wars. I worked on Star Wars. I worked on R2-D2. Star Wars Episode Seven just came out, and so everybody... It's funny to see R2-D2 be like the old guy compared to BB-8, who's like the new cute one. But this was another one of my jobs. I grew up, I am, I am old. I was born in 1970. I was seven years old when Star Wars came out. I went to go see it with my mom. It changed my life. That was when I knew I wanted to work with robots. In 1977, it was easier to put a guy in a suit than it was to make a consistent robot. In 1977, radio control was horrible. You would like be running, you'd be driving okay, and then you'd, for no reason whatsoever, run into a wall. So in certain situations, it was much better to put a guy whose name is Kenny Baker in the suit. But they used, they used some robots. As time went on, the technology got better, and we started using more robots. Here is how you can tell if it's a robot or if it's a guy in a suit. You count the legs. Whenever Kenny is in the suit, he actually has um, special foot pods that have boots. And so he puts 
his feet into these boots, and then he turns the head and moves the eye. All the robots have three legs, and they drive around no problem. No problem with the modern technology. So I was working on Star Wars Episode One, and my boss came in at that time with Steve Gall, and he's like, hey, 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 you want to work on R2-D2? <laughs> and of course, I, if, if you know what a nerdgasm is, <laughs> that's what I had. Because I grew, like I said, I grew up. I had all the action figures. I had the lunchbox. I had the, the bed sheets. I had the Millennium Falcon playset. I had everything. And R2-D2 was one of my heroes. So to get the chance to work on R2 was a dream come true. And I took all the systems and updated them. A lot of them hadn't been updated since 1983 since Empire. And there's a lot of R2s. Oh, here I am. Uh, oh, hey, wait. This is, a, this is a land speeder. The land speeder, by the way. People ask, why are there so many R2-D2s? Well, a lot of them have, first of all, you have to have backups, just in case something happens, right? Then, there are slow ones and there are fast ones. Slow and precise, if you're driving near people, you don't want to run over Carrie Fisher's foot. But if you're running in a hangar, you want to be able to go really fast. There are stunt ones that you can throw off the edge of a barge into the sand, and then there are Kenny ones. So there's a lot of different reasons. Okay, search for answers. When I graduated college, when I was your age, there was no internet. When I graduated, can you imagine a world without the internet? There was no Amazon, there was no Google. The internet did exist, but it was a place for you to get data sheets for electronic components and send and receive email between educational facilities. If you wanted to search for something, I think it was called Gopher. The advantage that you have today is that so much information is available right at your fingertips. Even in 1999, when I started my hobby. So what does a, a guy who works in special effects and builds robots during the day do for a hobby? He fights robots. But when I was designing my robot Deadblow, I didn't have a whole lot of resources even then. I had to search for the information. I had to take things that were made for other things, a scuba tank for my air source, paintball elements for my valves. It was something that I, I, I didn't have all the information that I needed. I couldn't go to a shelf. I couldn't go to a website that was like, you know, and, and actually there is a website now where you can go and order fighting robot parts. But back in those days, we had to make it up. We had to find things that worked and cobble them all together to make something. So when you have a fighting robot competition, where do you fight inside of a giant arena? The reason why these walls are this tall and are made out of two and a half inch bulletproof glass, Jamie Heineman. Back when Robot Wars, back when this was Robot Wars, audience like this, people thought, oh, let's say the robots are fighting up here. I will put up an eight foot wall, no problem. Make it out of acrylic, quarter inch acrylic, no problem. People will be able to see anything that comes off will get, will just bounce back. Jamie's robot, Blendo, comes along, hits something, tosses it out way over the wall into the audience. And Tori Bellici was there. 
<laughs> it almost hit him. Fortunately, at that time, he was working for Jamie, so it was okay. But the people who organized the event said, Jamie, here is your trophy. Here is the prize money. Please take your robot and go home. And he said, well, I didn't even get to it. Like, no, no, no. No, no discussion. It's too deadly. And that is why we have the battle box, which also has a lid on it. What is the trophy for a fighting robot competition? It's a giant nut. I have two big ones and one small one. <laughs> uh, trophies, trophies. I used the resources that I had at Industrial Light and Magic to design and build my robot. I called George Lucas my most generous yet unknowing sponsor. It was job training. It actually was. And the robot did, it, it taught me all about materials and about how to put things together so they don't break. And the robot did so well in seasons one and two of BattleBots that they asked me to write a book. Do something crazy means think outside of the box. If you're trying to solve a problem, you may have to go outside of your normal channels and figure out what you're going to do. Jeff Peterson is a robot that I built for Craig Ferguson of the Late Late Show. He is a plastic skeleton that, has, that, that talks to him. When I was originally approached to do it, I said, would you like me to build this and be like, you know, Terminator? Because he said, robot skeleton. I'm like, oh, Terminator, right? And he's like, no. I want it to be as cheap as possible. I said, do you want to do all these things? He said, no. I want it to have a jaw that moves, a head that turns, and one arm. That's it. So I said, OK. I, went outside of that. I programmed a microcontroller to uh, control him. I gave him a punk rock mohawk, blue eyes. But all of this, I was kind of making it up as I was going along. And a lot of times, you have to go where the design takes you. All pretty standard, very high, high load servos, power supplies. This is what made him talk. Radio control receiver, sequencing for servos. So all, of, all in all, that was a great project. It, they wanted it to be delivered within a few days. I was working on Mythbusters full time, so I had to give it to them in about four weeks. But each week, I would give them an update and make it so that somehow the robot was working great and then it malfunctioned, like chop somebody's head off. It was a good project. What Craig said was initially, people will probably hate this, so don't worry. He said, but then they'll get used to it and they're going to come to love it. I said, how do you know? And he said, Craig Ferguson introduced little puppets and a dancing horse to his, not a real horse, two guys in a horse suit. He introduced these things to his show, and he said, people hate it at first, but when you take it away, they're like, where did the puppets go? Where did the dancing horse go? And, and Jeff Peterson became a big part of his show, Take a Chance. That might be one of the most important things I can tell you to do. And I think here at Campus Party, it's about communicating, sharing ideas, and taking a chance with those ideas, presenting them to other people. Pretty good. Mythbusters has been on the air for 10 years. We are done. 
Um, and it's been, I have to say, it's been one of the best jobs I've ever had. And I've had a lot of really good, really cool careers. But the aspect of solving problems on a daily basis and building machines that no one has ever seen. Because really, you can't go to the internet and order a machine that will swing a sword very, very fast, or one that will kick a soccer ball at the speed of sound, or fire a piece of glass fast enough to chop a person's head off. These are things that don't exist on websites. So the opportunity to be able to build these things was fantastic. And like I said, there's a new show. Yes, there is. It's coming soon. It has me and Tori and Carrie. And we are doing things similar to what you've seen before, but it's not Mythbusters. And that's all I can tell you about that. But when it does come out later on this year, you'll, you'll know, believe me. OK. Now, I'm going to show a video that I don't normally get to show. I can only show in live events. And then after that, I will take questions and answers from all of you. So let's go ahead and roll the video. In three, two, one. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so you can blank out the screen and put the logos back up. We are ready for question and answer. If you have a question, raise your hand. We have microphones that are going to come out and find you. And I have this translation device. So. Alô, alô. Okay, pessoal. Pessoal, se você for fazer a pergunta, ele está com o tradutor. Se for fazer a pergunta em inglês, avisa para ele tirar o tradutor. Se você for fazer a pergunta em português, ele, ele vai, o tradutor vai, vai traduzir. E outra coisa é o seguinte, ele infelizmente tem um voo para pegar logo depois, ele, sa, ele saiu dos Estados Unidos, tinha, só pôde tirar um dia do programa novo dele, então ele veio correndo, vai voltar correndo. Então aproveita agora para fazer pergunta que não tem pergunta depois do lado, ok? Beleza? Então, vai lá. É, eu, eu, vou fazer a pergunta em, eu vou fazer a pergunta em inglês. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I can hear it. Yeah, go ahead. It's awesome. And my boy, my brother is in our house. 
seen us and he asked me to ask you what what was the most uh, amazing experiment in Mythbusters <laughs> but I have just one more question what's the experiment that you most like to build not exploding things to do the, the experiment to create the machine okay I can talk about what is the your favorite experiment and what machine do you like how did you enjoy building the most favorite experiment it's really hard over 10 years you've done something like 380 experiments and and in those many more mini experiments i will say one of the the most satisfying builds was tennis wing walk and tori and i were trying to play tennis on the wing of an airplane it's based on a viral video the problem is and we found the plane there is a plane a real plane that can do this the problem is discovery said no way nobody gets on the wing of any airplane in flight you cannot do that so we had to build our own we built a 40 foot long wing probably from about here to there elevated about as high as the screen off the ground on the bed of a uh, on the back of a fat flatbed truck and drove up and down the runway it's that kind of problem solving of taking the myth down to its elements and finding out what are the most important things the size of the wing the flow of the air over that wing where the people are situated these are things that you have to get right if you have these things right then it doesn't particularly matter if it's an airplane in the air or if it's something on the ground that's simulating the right conditions as far as the favorite thing that I built sword swinging robot the sword swinging robot was one of the first very very deadly things that I ever built if you watch that episode and it's early in my career it was like the first season that I was on the show if you watch that episode and me and Tori and Carrie are standing there I think one of us has a football helmet the other has a hard hat we actually don't know what to expect and how you know that you've built something truly dangerous is that everybody in the room including you kind of unconsciously takes a half step back that's still one of my favorites okay another question yes yeah uh, was there an experiment that went so wrong that you you couldn't even show on the television that had to give up um, as a rule as a rule everything that we film goes on TV or rather every every story that we film goes on TV because a lot goes into the filming of these of these experiments a lot of a lot of time and effort and money goes into filming something the only reason a story doesn't go to TV is if the network feels that there is some compelling reason why it should not be on the air the only story that I can think of involved Carrie now a lot of people know that we did an episode all about farts about passing gas and you know the stories that were in there there were actually two stories that did not make it in and they were fully filmed we had results they were edited they were awesome except the network felt that they were in poor taste one of those stories was do women fart 
Women are humans, just like men. Humans fart. But in order to prove this to people, we wanted to make sure. And we had Carrie, who is a woman, put on a special pair of underwear. In this underwear was a pocket. The pocket had a, a meter for hydrogen sulfide, which is an element that you emit when you fart. If she farted, the meter would go beep, 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 beep. But we had to make sure. Maybe we missed the beep, beep, beep. So we also put a microphone <laughs> in this underwear. And, and just to be really, really sure, we connected it to the speakers in the shop. And I know, right? And so eventually she went the whole day without farting because, you know, she was embarrassed, right? If you, if you even peep, it comes out on the speakers and everybody goes, what? She went the whole day without farting until Adam said, this is unacceptable, you have to produce what, and then she did on command. The network felt that this was in poor taste. The other story that didn't make it in was lighting your farts on fire. And again, this was fully shot, fully edited, ready to go story. Adam built um, a chair with with supports to put his feet in, right? He had a, a little, a long lighter, right? He was ready. We had a high-speed camera right on his jeans. And you can see, because there is an element that, again, another element that you emit, the methane, that, that is flammable. In our high-speed footage that's really, really close on his butt, you could see the, 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 the texture of his jeans, right? It starts to flutter. <laughs> and then a flame, this beautiful flame comes out. And he's like, wow, woo. So you can smell, it's like, it's like burnt denim from my jeans. The network felt that this was also in poor taste. So um, you, you, you could not see them on TV, but you might be able to see them on the internet. You didn't hear it from me. Yes, got another question? Yes. Hi. Hi. idea of getting engineering and entertainment together is something I've always been interested in. Yes. And I'm currently uh, studying engineering in college, and I would like to do that in the future. So I want to know if you did anything special, like some extra academic, maybe some intern job while you were in college, and if you think that's important to do. Yeah. So the idea of combining engineering and entertainment was there anything that I did special in college? And let me just say, I didn't mention it here, but in addition to going to Tom, Tom Holman, and becoming his assistant, I also became an intern for Lucasfilm, which is what led to my job right after school. Right out of school, I went to work for THX. If you can find an internship in the field that you want to go in, you should absolutely do it. And here's why. An internship is a limited time deal, maybe three months, which is great. Because there's no pressure to hire you at all. The companies don't have to hire you. And you know what? 
at the end of three, three months, you don't have to work there. It's a great no pressure way to try out the thing that you want to do. And after that, I went back to school and, and at the end of my three months, they said, hey, you know what? When you're done, come back because we want to give you a job. And that's, that's how I got my job. So yes, yes to internships and yes to studying on your own, which I think a lot of you probably do already. If there's something that interests you, like programming Arduino or doing some, uh, some other mechanical design, you probably are already doing that. And having the ability to go to the internet and see what other people have done and compare that to your problem and then come up with your own solution, that's, that's incredibly powerful. And when you come up with your own solution or you incorporate some other engineering that somebody else did, that's something that stays with you. You remember that because, because you put a lot of work into that. That'll become part of you. Yes. Hi. OK. OK, we got time. This has to be the last question because I have to go to the airport. I know, I'm sorry, but I promise you. Uh, how about this? Who wants to take a picture? OK, good. We're all going to take a picture together right after this. <laughs> so stay right there. <laughs> We're going to do the biggest selfie ever. OK, yes. Uh, you said that you'd like to put together cinema, art, and robotics. And you were really successful doing that. I'd like to know if there's anything else that you like to do, you dream about, but you didn't have the opportunity to do yet. Oh, yeah. So one of my dreams was to combine engineering and entertainment, make robots for movies and TV, which I was able to do. I was very lucky. I've been able to fight robots against each other in a ring. Very lucky to be able to do that. I think the next big thing is to fight giant robots <laughs> against each other on TV. So, and that, that has always been a dream of mine, you know, like um, Gundam and Robotech and, and all the anime. I mean, this is like, this is the dream. So. Uh, I'm working with a group of guys called Megabots who are based in America. They've challenged Japan to a fighting robot match. It's going to happen probably in about, say, eight months or so. But their robot is as tall as a screen. Eventually, if this concept catches on, what we want to do is scale it up even higher. Someday. So thanks again, Campus Party, for the opportunity to speak to you, all of your enthusiasm. It is awesome. All right, let's do that selfie. Everybody, everybody stand up. Aí, galera, vamos mostrar para ele o que é Campus Party. Vamos lá. Oh! Oh! Ah! Oh! 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 Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's awesome. É isso aí, galera. Vamos pedir aqui. Ele vai tentar passar rapidinho. Tá certo que ele tem um voo para pegar. Tá certo? Então, vamos respeitar. Pedir o seguinte, todo mundo que pegou o radinho, não esquecer de devolver. Tá certo? Porque senão eu sei que você vai querer tirar foto com o cara ali, vai que sai caçar correndo. A gente vai tentar fazer o que der, mas né, ele vai ter que passar correndo, infelizmente. Mas não esquece de devolver o radinho. E é o seguinte, aqui no palco principal, na sequência, agora começam de novo todos os palcos. Aqui no palco principal, na sequência, vai rolar a palestra super bacana do pessoal da TIM, falando sobre como fazer o seu jogo. Tudo que você precisa saber para fazer um game. Então, vem para cá. Se você quiser aprender como fazer game, o pessoal da Team vai te mostrar 
e vai mostrar também como é que você pode colocar o seu game para ganhar grana. Tá certo? Então, é, fica aqui às 9h15, aqui no palco principal. Se você preferir, é, ainda na área de desenvolvimento de software, no palco de desenvolvimento, vai rolar é, o Fernando Babadopoulos falando sobre Big Data, tá certo? Lá no palco de desenvolvimento. Então, cheio de conteúdo rolando aqui, não perca. Para o estagiário.